This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show, where we celebrate the role players and the underdogs in sports. And today is our last episode of 2022. It's been a pretty great year, folks. And to wrap up our 2022 here on the Moonlight Graham Show, our Moonlighter for today is the all-time leading scorer from Drake University, a left-handed point guard from Wisconsin, played from 2014 through 2018. His name is Reed Timmer. And if you look at the Drake basketball record books, Reed Timmer has a bunch of records. I shouldn't say every record, but he's got a ton of records. He's number one all-time leading scorer, the only guy in Drake University history to score over 2,000 points. And he actually didn't score over 2,000 points because he scored 2,000 points on the button. Pretty cool to play four years and score exactly 2,000 points. He's the He also is the all-time minutes played leader. He played 4,003 minutes in his career. Josh Young, who played from 2006 through 2010, he had 4,002 minutes. So he beat Josh Young by one minute in the all-time minutes played record. Another interesting fact about Reed Timmer, he's the all-time leader at Drake in free throws made, free throws attempted, and free throw percentage, which I think is a pretty cool thing. The guy got to the line. He knew his game because he made a lot of free throws, and so that's probably a big reason of why he became Drake's all-time leading scorer. And even though Reed had a really great career at Drake, his first three years, they won a grand total of 23 games. So the you know if you follow Drake basketball through the years, there's been – a Final Four team. There's been a couple of Missouri Valley championships. They've had some really high points. But as a program, the program itself has won about 46% of their games in program history. So traditionally, it has not been a really good program. They are on the upswing right now with Darian DeVries as the head coach. But Reed Timmer was playing right before the recent upswing. So before Nico Medved took over, before Darian DeVries took over from Medved, there were some dark days of Drake basketball, and Reed Timmer was the main guy on a couple of those teams. And then Medved comes in during Timmer's senior season. Drake goes 500 that year. They had a really good team that year, and you could see the building blocks of what the program has become. After Drake... Timmer goes on and he plays over in Europe for four seasons and he decides to hang it up recently to come back to Drake to get a degree in pharmacy and he's also working as a as a color analyst for uh, Drake's TV and, and radio programming. What I think is cool about Reed Timmer is not only was he a successful basketball player and has good perspective on things but he stopped playing basketball when essentially he was at the top of his game. You know, he's getting into his mid to late 20s. He's playing the best basketball he's ever played. But he realized that, hey, there's more to me than playing basketball. I want to go back to school. I want to get my pharmaceutical degree. I want to start my next career, the next chapter in the Reed Timmer story. And I've always thought it was fascinating for if you're if you're not playing at the highest level of a sport. And and really even if you are playing at the highest level, there's a lot of guys that don't enjoy the sport. They get burned out. They're playing for the paycheck. They're tired of the practice, the grind, the travel, all that stuff. And they decide to hang it up and to move along. And I'm always interested in having conversations with athletes about when that happens for them, what was the straw that broke the camel's back to make them finally make the move, to finally retire, to give up on the dream, to move on to the next page. Because so often athletes, their whole identity is wrapped up in who they are as an athlete, who they are as a basketball player, as a baseball player, as a football player. And Timmer has seemed to be transitioning very well to that next phase of his life. And he's doing it, what I would say, maybe, you know, two, three, four years earlier than what a lot of guys would do who have had his level of success. So that's why I wanted to have Reed Timmer on the podcast. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. 
Special thanks to you guys for following the pod, for subscribing, for liking, for leaving us a five-star review. It's been another great year here on the Moonlight Graham Show. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to our sponsors here at the pod, The People's Company. Check them out at peoplescompany.com. Matt Adams, Andrew Zelmer, they're the best land brokerage guys in the business. And enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter, Reed Timmer. Moonlighters, are you or someone you know moving down to Kansas City? Well, if you are, the one realtor that we trust and that you need to be calling is the great Brian Sandvig. As you well know, Brian Sandvig is our producer here on the podcast, and there is not a better residential real estate advisor down in the Kansas City marketplace than Brian Sandvig. Call Brian Sandvig, shoot him a text. Hey, DM us on social media. We'll get you connected with Brian if you can't find him on all the socials, but he is there and he is active, and he is your Kansas City realtor, so give him a call. All right, Reed Timmer. 2,000 point score with Drake basketball. Reed, you hit 2,000 points right on the number. How did you know that you were that close to 2,000? Like, how long did you know that like 2,000's right within reach? I might hit it, I might not. Like, was it a goal for you during your playing days? I knew my senior year that if I was I was on track to break uh, the record by Josh Young. And when I did that, it was against Bradley kind of late in the conference season. And that was a big win for us. And it was a big deal. Like they gave me the game ball and like announced that the record was broken. But in terms of like reaching 2000 points, it wasn't really in my head until like our last game where it was like, okay, I'm this far away from it. Then it was kind of in my head. But other than that, like for the whole season, it was not too much of a concentration point just concentrate on winning at that point i don't know if i believe that i mean i every guy is always running the numbers in their head i mean albert Pujols. the only reason why he was sticking it out as long as he he, he did <laughs> is because he knew 700 home runs like everybody knows the numbers you're telling me you had yeah. no idea like hey i gotta average 19.2 points a game for for 30 games to hit this record none of that was in your head that season that that season was was special for us, I think, just for a, a winning sake, because that our core group, we had been together for four years, some guys three years, and we hadn't been too successful, you know, our first three years being through three coaches and the coaching transition. And then that senior year, we finally had strung together a, a really strong team. We were battling for first place in the Valley with that Loyola team that went to the final four. So that was kind of what we were really focused on. I mean, I... I just wanted to win once all those, the record breakings like came with that. It was, I, I understood that that was going to happen kind of just naturally, but I wasn't going into every single game. I'm like, okay, I need to get 18 here. I need to get 20 here. You know, it was, it just, I knew it would come as if I just concentrated on, you know, what we needed to do game in and game out. And it was just, it just falls into place. Did that run that Loyola made that year? Did that surprise you guys? Or did you know that that team had it in them? They they were definitely – we knew that they were going to be really good. Did I think that they were going to go all the way to the Final Four? No, I don't think anybody did. They were just a really solid team. They weren't uh, intimidating on paper. You know, they didn't really have any big scores or big, you know, NBA-type guys, but they played really well as a team together. They had guys that were senior, a senior-led group. I had a few transfers in there and then, you know, a few bounce, bounces here and there, win against Tennessee and Miami, and then they just kept – kept going along so it was it was definitely cool for the valley to see just unfortunate for us that you know we had to put together a team that we thought was gonna do some damage in the valley tournament and against uh, the rest of the team or valleys and teams in the valley and that just happened so how much sister gene talk is there in the drake locker room <laughs> like <laughs> like she became like a bigger story than the actual loyola team when you guys are playing loyola does Sister Jean get mentioned just offhand in the in the locker room? A lot of yeah, a lot of the guys in the locker room were talking about how sick of her we were, just like hearing her, all of the stuff on social media with her, and then she's sitting there at some of the games. We we had a we had, we tried to use that as a chip on her shoulder to try and motivate us, but it's kind of hard when it's <laughs> Sister Jean to kind of like go at her in a sense. But it it was just kind of a an offshoot, I guess. So you mentioned it, your first 
three years, I think you guys won a total of 23 games. And then your last year, you have a really good turnaround year, 17 and 17. Nico Medved came in as the head coach that season. What was it about Nico that got the tide to turn at Drake? I think there's a lot of things that he did differently, but the things that stood out, I think my teammates uh, that season would agree. He, He allowed he was able to adjust really well in terms of like X's and O's and what we had as a team. You know, he didn't come in and force like a certain system on us. He kind of understood what he wanted to do and what he had as uh, talent around his team and kind of tailored what we were doing to that. I think he was very easy to build trust with him. The guys on the team really believed in him and his vision and it was easy to buy into what he was saying. Not a lot of coaches are like that. You know, they'll come in and think that, everything goes what they want to say and it doesn't matter what the players are thinking. And then, you know, I just think he understood how our team operated and what we wanted to get out of that last season. And he wasn't concentrating on, you know, transitioning this to be his program and like the longevity of it. He was bought in from the start to get the most out of that season from the guys. Cause we had a lot of upperclassmen and seniors. So I think we, we really appreciated him. Uh, for for doing that and it was uh, unfortunate for Drake that he ended up moving on but for us we kind of felt like we helped him get a promotion and that was kind of satisfying too so yeah was it tough as an upperclassman your final year new guy coming in to buying into yet again another system when you just have one more year left and it's like hey man I'm trying to hit 2,000 points here (laughs) yeah I I it I would lie. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous in terms of when you get a new coach coming in, you don't really know what he is about and what he wants to do. Uh, We had heard good things in the interview process and every meeting that we had with him uh, in preseason, once he got on campus was really good. But I think for me and a lot of the upperclassmen, it was just trusting him in the process, but also trusting our core group of guys because we had known each other for so long how easy it would have been for all of us to transfer. I mean, we hadn't been successful and we had been there for three years and there's another new coach coming. I mean, we all could have just left and the way college basketball is now, that's probably the case and over half of the teams in NCAA division one. So it's like, we, we decided to stay. We kind of had a little meeting and a, uh, a understanding between all of us that we're going to stay. We're going to find a way to make it work and we're going to, not leave this place without having a positive experience for a good, for one last season. You know, that's a good point. If, if that would have happened five years later, all of you guys probably would have transferred. I mean, you probably would have transferred to, you know, a major, major college program. And because everybody's taking those, you know, one year guys now, Absolutely. Um, but Drake would have been in a must different spot today if your class didn't stick around because Nico got it going and that leads into Darian DeVries and that program's in the best spot today as as it's been in you know decades so I I really didn't think about that until now of yeah you guys could have left how often do you guys talk about that now just like man if if it was a different era NIL era we could have jumped to you know North Carolina and Oklahoma or whoever it might have been Absolutely. I mean, the, the landscape back then was a little bit different where, you know, if you did have, if you did transfer, you did still have to sit out. There was no NIL money, nothing like that. So it's still, I, I personally stayed. And I think a lot of the guys would agree. I stayed because of the relationships I had with my teammates, as well as the school. I knew that that was the right fit for me academic wise. And I was big on academics. Um, not a lot of guys um, are, it's not important to a lot of people, but our team, there was a lot of guys that did care about that in terms of off the court stuff, but yeah, I mean, we, we talk about all the time. We're still really close. I'm still really close with a lot of uh, the guys in my class and our senior class. So it's just kind of a lifelong friendship thing that we decided to buy into instead of take the selfish way out. I like to, if you think about it that way, it's more of a selfish way out. I'm going to do what's best for me. And I don't blame guys for doing it nowadays because it just makes sense for them. And if they are just trying to get out of the college experience, get the most, money or if they're just trying to make it to the pros maybe that's the route you do take but uh we were a little bit different and we wanted uh, a positive experience to take lifelong friends with uh be set up for life after basketball and i think all those factors played into uh what ended up happening you're 
doing some analyst work for Drake nowadays, you and Michael Admire calling games together. What's the most challenging part of, you know, not being on the floor, sitting behind a microphone and calling a game? It came kind of naturally for me. I enjoy, I enjoy going on the road a lot with the team and enjoy being up front and watching games. The difficult part for me is just, I just want to be out there playing again. You know, it makes me miss the game a lot more, especially when I go with them on the road and you see the the process of, you know, traveling with the team, having a roommate on the road and team meals and all the stuff that is behind the scenes that you really miss being an athlete. Obviously the games are a big part of that, but it's just kind of that camaraderie that you miss in a locker room that I got to get to be a part of just through, you know, being an analyst for the team and, and interviewing some of the guys and talking to them, being close with them. But uh, just the, the most difficult part is, is still just missing the game and, and wanting to jump back out there. Is there anything that you see now that, you know, you're, let's see, five, six years out of college now, you're still around the Drake program. And the, so these guys are, are not that much farther than you, but there's a lot of life experience that you cram into the five, six years right after you leave college, right? And so now you mm-hmm. look back on these 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. Is there anything that you see that's like, man, it's so silly that we used to complain about this thing or or this piece, or if I would have known what I know now back then, I would have done this differently. And you see those kids maybe making the same mistake that you did or having the same type of attitude about a certain situation that you did, that you're like, I get it now that I'm 28, 29 years old. Uh, The biggest thing for me is watching the Drake team. I mean, they've struggled with injuries these last under coach DeVries' tenure. They've always had some kind of you know, big injuries happen at unfortunate times, which has affected their postseason play. And, and some of them are freak accidents. I understand that. But the thing that I learned the most is how to take care of your body for longevity purposes within the scope of basketball. I mean, I used to walk out to practice fresh off of class, sitting for two hours, walk right out there and jump into a full speed drill without doing any kind of preparation work, stretching or anything like that. You know, yeah, you walk through some of the strength coaches warm ups that takes two minutes. But I mean, really in terms of nutrition and, and stretching and all the things you need to do to keep your body healthy and to be able to play long term. I just I wish I would have known that when I was younger. And then I also try to instill that knowledge on on the guys that are playing now, because if a lot of them do have aspirations to to play after college and it was a rude awakening for me once my body got older into the professional ranks is like how much is involved with taking care of your body. And you do have more time when you're professional because that is your job. And these guys are sometimes in class or have other, uh, other things they have to do, but that's kind of my big thing. It's just taking care, taking care of your body and, and embracing what it takes to be ready every single day for practice. Who's the best player in Drake basketball history? (laughs) There's a ton. I mean, there's so many, I mean, you look at, at Adam Emenecker, what he did for the team. Josh Young, obviously, I'm still close with. Tucker now has to be up there with some of the best ever. And obviously, it's tough to compare eras. I mean, there's a lot of guys that were on the Final Four team that were obviously really, really good. Did I have a chance to see them? No, but their their names are hanging in the rafters for a reason. So there's a lot of really, really good players in Drake history. I mean, it's tough to say the best one. And, and it's such a tight knit family too. everyone. I feel like knows everybody and is, is uh, supportive of the program always moving forward. So it's, it's always fun to be a part of that, of that uh, group. So after Drake, you go on and you play over in Spain, you, you play overseas. What do we not know about playing overseas? Like, what do you wish that basketball fans here in America would know about, Hey, the European game, it's this, this, and this that you guys would just never understand. I think now people are starting to wake up a little bit more to it with how many uh, European guys are in the NBA now and how well they're doing with Jokic, Giannis. I mean, the list goes, Luca, all the list goes on and on, but the level of play in Europe is so, I mean, it is so high of a level that it's very hard to explain, but the way the game is over there, there's a certain specific rule changes that make it a little bit different than the NBA, which causes the game to look a little bit different. You know, the, the court's smaller. There's not as much one-on-one because there's no defensive three seconds in the lane. So you can kind of have your big guy stay in the lane for as long as you want, cause a lot more help 
and you have to play more as a team, more continuous. The guys are so they're ridiculously smart players over there. Their IQ is through the roof. They share the ball. It's, it's such a, I think it's a more beautiful game over there because the ball really never touches the floor. You see a guy, I mean, we used to get yelled at if we took more than three dribbles, maybe sometimes two, because you don't really need that many dribbles with how skilled those guys are over there. So with the NBA's game, it's a lot of isolation one-on-one for good reason, because they are the best in the world, but because of how the rules are in the NBA, if you take some of those rules out, it's the NBA in Europe. I mean, it is unbelievably high level basketball over there. So with a lot of the changes they've made to the G league, they've made the G league more enticing for a lot of guys instead of taking the money in Europe, which has kind of been the thing, you know, for a long time, it's like, if you're not making the NBA, you'd rather be instead of playing in the CBA or even the G league, the, the D league for a while, you'd, you'd rather go to Europe, right? We've seen a mm-hmm. lot of guys from Iowa, Iowa state Drake do that through the years with the changes that the G league have, has made, if you were coming out now, would you still choose to go over to Europe or, or would you try to stay in America and play in the G league? I think that has a lot to do with your personality and what you want to get out of basketball, because there's a lot of guys that are in the G league that are there because they're missing like one or two pieces that they're right on the cusp of the NBA with some of these guys with two way contracts and they've gotten chances to be in the NBA. If that's, if that's your case and that's your opportunity and you're still young and there's still an opportunity for you to be up and down with the NBA, then I would say stay in the G league. But if you are on a standard G league contract and they did bump up the salary, I think it's closer to above 40,000 for a standard contract. Now I would say if you have the personality trait of being independent and really, really loving the game of basketball, I would say go to Europe and get paid because your body's only young once and there's a window of opportunity to go get paid, especially now with how much the game has grown over in Europe and how much money there is to be made over there. I would say if that is the case, go explore opportunities in Europe and try to have as good of a experience over there as possible and build a career over there. And then that's not to say is if you go over to Europe and uh, you can't make it back to the NBA. I mean, look at Matt Thomas played in Spain as well. And, I mean, he had an effective field goal percentage over there, like 97%, and then boom, he gets signed in the NBA. So it's still possible to have the route of going to Europe then back to the NBA. So that would probably be uh, my answer is try to try to go over there and get paid. When do you know, like, I, I believe you're retired right now. You just kind yeah. of wrapped up your yeah. pro career. You're back. You're in the pharmacy program, Brack at Drake. When do you know is the right time to retire? Because obviously you're not one of these guys, or at least from what I understand, that wants to hang around too long because you got other aspirations for your career and for your life other than just basketball. How do you know when the right time to make that call is? I definitely still think I have, like, I could have still kept going and playing. Uh, I was only uh, 26 when I retired, call it quits. But I, I talked to a lot of the vets on some of my teams over there and asked them the same question. Like, when did you feel is your prime? And then when do you think it was time, like in terms of how your body feels to cut it off? And a lot of the common answers I kind of thought were, I got back were 27 is about when they felt is their best body, how they, how their body felt and with their knowledge of the game for how long they've been playing it. And then once you hit like 33 to 36 range is when your body just starts not giving back to you what you put in it and it's time and in players know too like they know what they expect from themselves in a game and if their body's not allowing them to do that and to play at a level that they are wanting to then it's time to call it quits or you can go play for fun in some of the smaller leagues over there or come back for a smaller role in the g league or something but I, I would say your body will tell you and a lot of different guys' bodies are different. You know, LeBron James is a different, has a different body than me. So he's still playing at a really high level and he's that old, but you know, that's kind of the, the usual answer is what I got from uh, my teammates. How tough is it on your ego now when you, you know, you're, kind of at the prime of your career, really, from a physical standpoint, you get to your late 20s and early 30s. That's when guys are really at their peak 
athleticism meets knowledge of the game meets craft and everything else. And you're playing in a pickup game with like guys that I work with, like, <laughs> yeah. is that tough on your ego being like, God, you know, I used to be cooking guys like a hundred times better than you. And now I'm playing against insurance salesmen. Yeah, no, it was definitely probably the first three to five months after I retired, it was a very mentally, it was tough on me. Just, just not so much playing in these pickup games, but it was like, who am I now? You know, I've been, basketball has been so such a big part of my identity my whole life. And to now have that taken away, it's how do I transition as a person? How do I transition into a new life without this thing that has been such a mainstay in my life by, for as long as I can remember? So I, when I play in these pickup games with all of our, our friends, it's like now it's out of enjoyment and it's out of missing the game. It's not as much, you know, oh, I wish I was going playing out there again. I wish I was cooking guys back, whatever league it is. It's now, it's just making relationships and making new friends and, and making a uh, commitment to the people around me to just stay connected with basketball, not necessarily in the player aspect, but more as, uh, you know, an old guy now just making, making friends, going to play pickup on Tuesdays and Fridays and just enjoying the workout aspect of it instead of the, the game. How often do you turn it on all the way? Like, it's like, <sighs> this is, you know, this is me playing to the max instead of like trying to play into the flow of the game that you get in a standard pickup game. I would say some of the guys, some of the younger Drake guys who are still playing overseas come back, uh, and have trained in the summers and a few of them are back uh, in this window now trying to get signed again. And they're sometimes back in the gym. I'd say when they're, when they come back and want me to participate and help them, that's when I would say I would turn it on the most because they have the most to gain out of it. I have nothing to gain from it, but if I can help them be prepared for what is next for them, their next team and their next role, if I can, just managed for one or two days to turn it all the way up just to give them a good look. It, it, in, it motivates me to do that. But in terms of like just my normal pickup games twice a week, very rarely will it go all the way up to a hundred percent. I'm just trying to get a good uh, sweat in and some cardio, you know, how much of your success do you think is due to you being left-handed? Uh, it's definitely different it's a different look. It's just different habits. A lot of guys, I mean, I took advantage of it, especially uh, growing up in the younger ranks, just because not a lot of experienced defenders out there are used to, you know, you're used to closing out with a hand with your left hand up because the guy's a righty. But if I come and shoot with my left hand, it's a little bit more of an open look, but it's, it's been something obviously that has contributed to my success. Do I think that's the only reason? No, but it's definitely something that has helped because it throws throws teams off it throws habits off and it throws guys off their usual rhythm defending so who's the best guy you ever guarded no oh, that's that's a tough one i in college the guess best player i probably had to guard and we played probably was fred van vliet i think just because of how good those wichita teams were and how good he was individually I mean, just never made a mistake, knew the, like made the right decision all of the time and how tough of an environment those old Wichita teams were in those 10,000 fans. You couldn't hear our coach in the huddle. You couldn't hear your teammates calling out plays. It was, it was ridiculous. So I would say him. Who's the guy that you played against that you can't believe never cracked the NBA? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, he he did end up playing a little bit in the NBA, but his name is Joel Blumboy out of Weber State. My sophomore year, we played him in a Thanksgiving tournament, and he had one of the nastiest dunks I've ever witnessed in my life. I was like a rebound put back, almost like a 360 on top of one of our four men. And I said, that guy is one of the most athletic guys I've ever seen in my life. And he ended up sticking with a few teams uh, for maybe their 15th, 16th roster spot and playing over in Europe. But that guy was the most athletic guy we've ever played against. So I was always just assuming he would find a role, but I guess his, his game didn't translate the best to the NBA. 
Final question here, Reed. So with, with all of this changeover happening with NIL and transfer portals, it feels like an, a really unsteady landscape right now across college basketball. Is this good or bad for Drake? I think it depends on the program and how Coach DeVries handles it. I think he's doing a really good job initially. There's a lot of stuff up in the air right now in terms of regulations and how boosters, how the community is investing in players specifically. But if it's utilized the right way and guys are treated right, but they then they also know what to, their expectations are, I think it can be really helpful for Drake because of the community we're in in Des Moines, hometown team. There's a lot of supporters that want to see the team do well and are willing to help help the guys out when needed. But it's very interesting to see how this will play out in the next two to three years because right now it's kind of like a free-for-all. These guys are going asking for ridiculous amounts of money. And I've seen, not at Drake, but I've seen guys go other schools and it's like, you're a professional. It's like, okay, this school's giving me this. Go to talk on the phone, getting recruited. It's like, okay, X school's giving me this much money, what are you going to give me? Because if you're not going to match or over it, I'm going over there. It's plain and simple. So, and then the other side to that is you offer that much money to these kids that are 18 to 20 years old. What happens if they get injured? What happens if they don't perform? What happens if they get benched? All these things are, is the contract that they've signed for this NIL, are there stipulations or is it just up to the booster or whoever has the money? Is it up to their discretion? Do they withhold the money? Do they say, well, I'm only going to pay you if you win X amount of games. So there's just so much involved and there's so much free for all going on right now. That's tough to say how it'll affect Drake. But I think as long as everyone is transparent and everyone understands expectations, I think it can really boost Drake's ability to get recruits, boost Drake's ability to keep guys from transferring and try to build a program around a strong community. Would you ever give money to the NIL? Like say Drake had its own collective, like is Reed Timmer going to give money to it? <laughs> I mean, I have to, eventually I have to graduate and finish all my <laughs> grad school stuff, but you never know. I mean, if it makes sense to whatever I get out of it and the player gets out of it, I think it's a very good investment for some of these uh business owners especially around uh des moines because it's just it makes sense it gets your name out and if they can find a way to almost market their you know whatever they're giving it's a two-way street and both parties win awesome well reed timmer thanks for joining the podcast man um it was fun. I always liked watching you because I liked, I love the lefty. I love the lefty guards like, you know, Damon Stoudemire and Kenny Anderson and just the lefty guards through the years. I've always just been a big fan of. Uh, and you were that guy for Drake for four years. Always win it. Like you had a good run against uh, Iowa. You were put into Iowa one year. I think you guys ended up losing that game, but you had a great game. And it was just, you always were that guy that like could get hot and take over a game. And I loved watching it. So it, pleasure to get you on the pod. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. You bet. Thank you for listening to today's episode with Reed Timmer. Like we talked about before the interview, we are wrapping up 2022 and just wanted to thank you guys again for following the show on social media, for subscribing to the podcast here, for leaving us a five-star review, for spreading the word of the role players and the underdogs and the Moonlight Graham Show podcast. So a couple of things. I want to recap our top 10 episodes of 2022. And I also want to give my number one underdog story of 2022. I actually should have had this ready to go for the Tyler O'Shea episode that we did a couple of weeks ago. But as I was thinking about it over the past week, what was the best underdog sports story of this past year? And the more I thought about it, I think it's just impossible to beat the St. Peter's basketball story from March Madness in early 2022. It's just hard to beat those great March Madness underdog stories, especially when it's a school like St. Peter's, which 99% of the sports world had never even heard of. So just to remind you guys of St. Peter's in that run, they were a, 
a 15 seed and in their opening round game of the NCAA tournament. And once again, St. Peter's is a college in New York, the size of like Valley high school in West Des Moines. It's got like 2000 kids in the entire school. And I always think that's a poor way to measure how big of an underdog a school is because really the size of the school doesn't matter for the, the power of the athletic program because you still have the same amount of scholarships at the division one level, but still it's a really, really tiny school in New York and they're playing maybe the most famous blue blood program of all time, the Kentucky wildcats in game one of the NCAA tournament. And they beat Kentucky in which many people were saying, even though it was a two fifteen game and not a 16, one game, this might've been the biggest like Vegas upset in college basketball history at the time. So after they beat Kentucky in round one, they go on to beat Murray State in round two. Murray State was a seventh seed. And all of a sudden, St. Peter's, who nobody had ever heard of, they were in the Sweet 16. In the Sweet 16, they played third-seeded Purdue. Purdue was like the number one team in the country this year because they returned a lot of guys from last year's team. And also, they had Jaden Ivey, first-round pick from Purdue last year. And St. Peter's pulled off that upset as well. And and to me, the upset of Purdue in the Sweet 16 to advance to the Elite Eight, that might have been even more improbable than the Kentucky win because at this point you can see how a first-round game, a Kentucky is going to overlook a team like St. Mary's. But nobody's going to overlook a Sweet 16 game. And by that point, Purdue had not only a whole season of tape to scout St. Peter's, but also two NCAA tournament games to scout St. Peter's. And St. Peter's still pulled off the upset. And so for them advancing to the Elite Eight after those victories over Kentucky, over Murray State, and then over Purdue, I think that's got to be my favorite and probably the best underdog story for sports in 2022. But I also want to put it up to you. What was your favorite sports story, especially underdog role player sports stories of the year? Let us know. Tweet at us. Send us an email. We'd love to hear about it. Our top 10 most downloaded episodes from this year. Here they are. Number 10, the U.S. Open local qualifier back in May from Sam Moret. You know, this was probably the fourth episode that Sam and I have done together. Uh, Third time I had been on his bag. Not a great performance for Sam and I this year, but those podcasts are always fun to do. That was the number 10. Number nine, Nick Collison and the Field of Dreams game. So I did not go to the Field of Dreams game this year, but Nick Collison, Moonlighter, friend of the show, him and his dad, Dave Collison, went. And then we had Nick do an episode with us right after that game to give his thoughts on the field of dreams and his perspective from being there this year. Number eight, Carter Baumler, uh, who's, you know, West Des Moines Dowling kid, minor league baseball player from Dowling. That's in the Baltimore Orioles system. We did that one right around spring training last year. Uh, Trevor Penning, first round draft pick guys uh, from that clear Lake Mason city area. First round draft pick out of you and I by the new Orleans saints. He was our number eight, eight episode or excuse me number seven episode of the year number six episode of the year and actually one of my personal favorites is when we had the batting stance guy on the pod right the batting stance guy everybody has seen him he's a great twitter account great instagram account to follow our sixth most downloaded episode of the year number five spencer brown starting right tackle for the buffalo bills who have got a chance to win the super bowl here he was on the podcast at the start of the nfl season Number four episode of the year, Pat Hoberg, probably the best umpire on planet Earth, friend of the program. He's been on the pod three different times now. He called a perfect game in the World Series, and he is our fourth most downloaded episode of the year. Number three, Adam Fellers. Adam Fellers, wrestling podcast, great wrestling guy, Fort Dodge Dodger, former Hawkeye, Great podcast. Tommy Griffin and I did that one together. Check it out if you haven't listened to it yet. Number two, another personal favorite of mine, Marty Sutherland, the head assistant coach for the baseball program over at the University of Iowa. Marty is not only a friend, but he was also a coach of mine at the University of Northern Iowa when I played over there. He is now the top assistant over at Iowa. He's a great recruiter. He's a great baseball guy. He's a great coach. And you know what? 
He was a pretty darn good podcast as well. And then our number one most downloaded episode of the year, a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of a surprise, but another friend of the program, he's been on twice now, Fort Dodge native, future Hollywood walk of fame guy, Ben Ollers. He's in the HBO show, The Gilded Age. You're going to be seeing him in Hollywood movies, in HBO shows. He's an up and coming actor, big deal, fun to get him on the podcast as well, Ben Ollers was our number one most downloaded episode of the year. A couple of honorable mention episodes, Ryan Harclaw that we did just last week. Um, his episode is right up there climbing the charts. Eric Stein, head coach over at Iowa Central, he just missed the top 10. You know what? Our swimming episode, the Minnesota 1984 swimming episode, is right outside of the top 10 as well. So it was a real, another really great year on the podcast, probably our most successful year to date. So once again, thank you guys for listening. Spread the word about the Moonlight Graham Show. Thank you especially to the Moonlight Graham Show team, my brothers Andy and Neil, Tommy Griffin, Brian Sandvig, Brendan Gargano. It's the best podcast team in the business, folks. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving us five-star reviews. Have a great New Year's. Have a great Christmas season. And have a great week, Moonlighters. It's Moonlight Graham. Yeah. It's a pretty good program Broadcasting to the heartland Sports stories for the every man It's Moonlight Graham, yeah Please follow us on Instagram You're loving us on Twitter too you download every part we do. It's Moonlight Graham.